The first thing we need to do is a little review before we start talking about water and introducing the individual biomolecules. I'm sure that most of you, well, all of you actually, should have been familiar with some of these metric prefixes. These are the prefixes that I wish you to refresh your memories on. Uh, kilo, deci, centi, milli, micro, nano, and pico. Well, in the past, you've probably dealt with prefixes uh, down to the micro level. When we look at biological systems, the concentrations of solutions that, we, that are found in the body are very, very low. So we also need to include nano and pico. Many calculations that you'll be doing when we look at kinetics will involve concentrations of solutions down in this very low range. So here we have the prefix, symbol, decimal equivalent, and the power of 10. We will primarily deal with milli down to pico. So make sure you know how to manipulate these prefixes with respect to molarity and uh, do calculations with them. Primary elements in our bodies. So there are about 99% of the atoms in the body are um, composed of hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen. We do have some sulfur as well. Um, it's not listed here in this chart, but as you see, we're given the percentages 63% hydrogen, 25.5% oxygen. Why so much hydrogen and oxygen? 70, uh, 70 to 78% of our body is water. So thus we do have a high, percentages, high percentage of hydrogen and oxygen. And all of our biomolecules contain carbon um, and some contain nitrogen. As I mentioned before, we also have some sulfur, and we'll see that when we look at the amino acids. You don't need to know these percentages, but I just want you to be aware of uh, their, their relationships or their differences here. All of the biomolecules that we'll be looking at um, being molecules, they are uh, have covalent bonds between those atoms within those molecules. And this, this figure depicts the type of bond and the bond energy associated with that. So what does that bond energy tell us? Well, the bond energy is a measure of bond strength. The weakest bond is going to be the single bond. Double bonds are going to be a little stronger triple bonds even stronger. And we can see that reflected in the bond energy, which again, by definition, or by definition, is the amount of energy required to break Avogadro's number of molecules, or one mole of molecules, into their individual atoms. And this again is directly uh, related to bond length. So if we look at the carbon single bond carbon bond, Bond energy here is 343 kilojoules per mole compared to the carbon-carbon double bond, which is 615 kilojoules per mole. This chart, chart excuse me, uh, or figure does not show a carbon-carbon triple bond, but we can look at a nitrogen triple bond here with a bond energy of 946 kilojoules per mole. Um, we have a nitrogen-hydrogen at 393 kilojoules per mole. So again, keep in mind, um, when we look at these molecules and the types of bonding that are in them, it is um, directly related to their, the, the energy required to break up that molecule is directly related to those bond energies. So what are some other properties of biomolecules? Uh, covalent um, bonds hold all of these molecules together. We will review the forces that influence the structures and behavior of all the biomolecules that we're going to look at. If you remember, those forces are called 
inter molecular forces. And we'll take a look at these um, again on the next slide. So the inter molecular forces are the forces that occur or the attractions, interactions that occur between molecules. These are these forces are constantly changing depending upon the type of the, the molecule and the physiological conditions under which they um, are found. We have an example of the, the range of these forces, 0.4 to 30 kilojoules per mole. So they're really weak forces in that sense. When you think about the intramolecular forces that we just looked at uh, between atoms within a molecule, these are the uh, I, IMFs or intermolecular forces that we're going to look at. Van der Waals interactions, which you may um, remember are also the same as London forces, hydrogen bonds, and ionic interactions, and hydrophobic interactions. So you should know the relative strengths of these forces between molecules. The Van der Waals again, um, or London forces, these depend upon the size of the atoms or molecules and the distance between them. As a molecule gets larger, as we will see with lipids, those London forces or Van der Waals interactions increase because they have a greater surface area. Uh, the strengths are given here. Again, Van der Waals can range from 0.4 to 4. We're not going to be too concerned with distances, but please note these distances also are very small, nanometers here. Hydrogen bonds, these are the strongest of the intermolecular forces, or IMFs, ranging from 12 to 30 kilojoules per mole. Uh, ionic interactions, 20 kilojoules per mole, and hydrophobic interactions are less than 40. We will um, take a look at these uh, forces momentarily. So that's all I'm going to say right here. So hydrogen bonds are very important in biological molecules. And here are the types of hydrogen bonds that can be formed. Also the approximate bond length. Again, these are nanometers, very small distances. If we look, and um, I should point out that this larger uh, line between the O and the H is the actual covalent bond, and the dashed line is the hydrogen bond. So hydrogen can form hydrogen bonds with fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. We will not see fluorine hydrogen bonds in biological systems, but we certainly will see hydrogen bonds with oxygen, whether it is charged or uncharged, nitrogen, whether it is charged, um, well, no, just uncharged nitrogen, sorry, I spoke there. We also have N bonded to H, uh, hydrogen bonding with oxygen, we have a protonated nitrogen, uh, that hydrogen bonding to oxygen, and then a deprotonated hydrogen bonding to this nitrogen. We will see these uh, interactions in a lot of our uh, biomolecules. So the functional groups that um, we'll see in hydrogen bonding can be classified as either donors or acceptors. So we will review the functional groups um, of organic molecules. This is a hydroxyl group, so if you need to review those, um, we will do so. This is a donor. This hydrogen is going to be attracted to a lone pair of electrons on either a nitrogen or another oxygen. This is an acceptor, so this hydrogen could hydrogen bond with either of these pairs of lone pairs. So this oxygen can form 
two hydrogen bonds. This depicts another oxygen with two uh, alkyl groups attached to it. That's what an R group is. So it's going to be, uh, excuse me, a group com composed of carbons and hydrogens. Here we have a uh, amine group. We have nitrogen bonded to two hydrogens. These hydrogens are going to look for lone pairs, again, to associate with. So acceptors have lone pairs of electrons. Donors have hydrogens. Here's a phosphate group. Uh, we will see uh, a couple biomolecules when we get to the glycerol, glycerol phospholipids, and uh, those can also be acceptors of hydrogen bonds. So here are the classes of organic compounds. Uh, beginning with, it begins with the alkenes and the alkynes. We will not um, see molecules with either of these functional groups. Um, we will see molecules that have a uh, benzene ring in them. We'll definitely see alcohols, which has the hydroxyl group. We have ethers here, thiol groups. We will definitely see thiol groups. That's an SH group bonded to carbon. It acts like a hydroxyl, a hydroxyl group. We will see aldehydes. So we have a carbonyl uh, at the end of a molecule, also bonded to a hydrogen and some R group off to the side. Ketones, we have two R groups with a carbonyl group in the middle. We will see carboxylic acids. So this is the carboxyl group. Um, basically, we have a, a hydroxyl group and that carbonyl together. Esters, we will see esters in reactions uh, or form in reactions. Amine groups, it's a, uh, the nitrogen with two or more carbon groups and the amide bond, which we will definitely see in our amino acids and proteins. So make sure you are familiar with these classes of organic compounds. So we also need to talk about oxidation states. Many of the reactions um, that we'll see between our biomolecules are going to be based on redox reactions. So this depicts um, just the smallest um, alkane, methane, and its different oxidation states. So in one direction, we're going to be oxidizing. In the reverse direction, we are reducing. So in or in organic chemistry, the definition of oxidation is loss of electrons. However, in organic chemistry, oxidation is the increase of CO bonds and a loss of hydrogen. So if we take a look at what happens to methane as it gets oxidized to carbon dioxide, this carbon uh, increases when we add this oxygen to have a carbon oxygen bond. So we increase CO bonds from zero to one. This alcohol, and this is methanol, the OL tells me it's an alcohol, plus we have that hydroxyl group. When this is oxidized, we get a C double bond O, or a carbonyl group here. So now we have two CO bonds. And when we, and this is formaldehyde, as you can see, we'll also talk about formaldehyde and formic acid um, when we take a look at um, oxidation again in the future. We can oxidize formaldehyde to formic acid. So now we have three CO bonds. We have the C double bond O in the carbonyl, and we have a CO because of this hydroxyl group. Take a look at the oxidation states of this carbon. It goes from a minus 4 to a minus 2 to a 0. So here it's got a 0 oxidation state. When we add a third, we have a plus 2 oxidation state. And when we further oxidize that to carbon dioxide, 
we have a plus 4 oxidation state. So the oxidation state is going to increase. Notice we have also lost hydrogens. We, we started with four hydrogens in methane, bonded to our carbon. Here we have three, two, one, and zero. In the reverse direction, we have reduction. So in reduction, we're going to decrease the CO bonds and increase the numbers of hydrogens, as you can see in reverse, and I'm not going to go through that. But make sure you understand the definitions for oxidation and reduction in organic molecules. Okay, so now we're taking an individual look at some of those interactions that occur between um, molecules and ions in this particular, uh, particular slide. So what we have here is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And we'll take a look at a number of molecules that involve ATP. And this is the ATP molecule. This is the triphosphate portion. Notice that it has three uh, negatively charged oxygens here and one here. Those negative charges can attract cations or positively charged ions. In this case, we have magnesium. So we will see ionic interactions uh, between ions and charged molecules. Not shown are hydrophobic interactions. We will look at those when we get into our lipid discussion. But basically, these occur between molecules that contain hydrophobic side chains. So when we look at our nonpolar amino acids, we will see that they uh, have hydrophobic interactions with other nonpolar molecules. Also, our lipids, which are both hydrophilic and hydrophobic, we will see those types of interactions as well. Here's another uh, depiction of ionic bonds that occur within molecules. So what we have here is a strand of protein. So a protein is composed of amino acids, and these amino acids, as we will see, have side chains which may or may not be charged or polar. Um, there happen to be three or four polar groups here. And what we have is um, actually a hydrogen bond here, um, but also an ionic interaction. We would have hydrogen bonding, which is depicted by the